Week in and week out, we have premium members taking home giant sums of money playing DraftKings for UFC. This past weekend, we had a $46,000 takedown, and that brings our total up to almost $400,000 in DraftKings fantasy winnings over the last couple of months. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire Noche UFC fight card, giving you my picks predictions, and DraftKings plays. But before I do, let's look at that wild success. So I do have a premium membership. It's $10 a month. It's going to give you tools, insight, information that's going to help you build winning lineups. The most recent winning lineup was from 33. He took down $46,000. That takes our total over the last three months over $370,000 in winning tickets. And this is everything from massive tickets, right? 78 grand, 50 grand, 46 grand, 10 grand, 12 grand, but also hundreds, 300, 400,000, 2,000. It's absolutely crazy what our premium members have been able to do. If you want to join them, go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member. It is only $10 a month, $10. And when I show you what you get for that $10, you're gonna realize it is the best value in this space. If you go to like an Osimo or a Roto Grinders, do you know they're charging $80 per sport, $100 for packages? And they don't have anything that we don't have. And frankly, what we have is better because our ownership projections are better. Our tools are better. Our insight is better. And it includes far more than just fantasy. And here's some context for you. Be nasty. He was a big, huge winner two weeks ago. Two events ago, he took down $51,000. He said, I can't believe they allow you guys to even offer these tools. I literally built my lineup using your optimizer." The optimizer that's included in the $10. He used it. He clicked a few buttons. It spit out a 50-something thousand dollar ticket winner. And then as I mentioned, 33 took down. He actually didn't even win the tournament, but he took home $46,000 in winnings. And he said, if you don't follow my boys, Jacobs and Angelo at We Want Picks, you should stay off of the betting books. Meaning... They got the goods. WeWantPicks.com. Click become a member. It's only $10 a month. You're going to get a full suite of DraftKings offerings. You're going to get our plays, our DraftKings plays, where we tell you who you should have in your cash core lineup, who should be in your GPP core lineup, what the live dog situation is, some leverage plays. This cheat sheet will be fully populated every Friday for every event, and it's going to give you the ownership projections, the scoring projections, and the leverage plays. The reason those numbers are so important is they go into the DraftKings Optimizer. This optimizer will literally build lineups for you. It'll build one lineup. It'll build 150 lineups. The most important part about this are the numbers that go into it, and we have the best numbers in the game that is an unequivocally factual statement. It's not subjective. It is objective. The best numbers go into the optimizer. The optimizer spits out the best lineups. And you saw those results. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It's only $10 a month. The last thing I'm going to mention before I break this card down, people watch this video. I think a lot of you watch it just for the breakdown, just for the picks. And you're not really here for the DraftKings fantasy component. If you don't know what DraftKings fantasy is, I'm telling you, it's a ton of fun. And it'll take a regular card that's just mediocre and it'll really make it enjoyable because now you're rooting for fighters that are in your lineup. If you don't know what DraftKings Fantasy is, become a premium member and you can unlock courses. If you click on more in the menu and then click on courses, we have a full DraftKings course. The beginner's guide to DraftKings is going to walk you through exactly what it is, exactly how to play it. It's five chapters long. There is a quiz at the end if you want to take that. And then we also have a full glossary of what these terms all mean. You'll hear people say GPP. What is GPP? What does that mean? All of that information is here. This is included with membership along with a million other things in this menu that I haven't gone through yet. The greatest value in this space. We want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. Let's go ahead and break this card down. We only have 11 fights. This is basically a pay-per-view, but not. It's on a pay-per-view timeline, right? It starts at 9 p.m. Central. It's in the T-Mobile Arena, which is the giant arena that they do these large Vegas pay-per-views in. And we have a title fight. So let's pretend this is a pay-per-view. We're going to start at the bottom, work our way up to the top. Opening up the card is Josephine Knutson taking on Marnik Mann. Both of these are short-notice step-ups. Both of them are technically UFC debuts, even though there is some contender series experience in there. Josephine Knutson was on this card, was supposed to fight somebody else. The fights got shuffled, or sorry, was not on this card. 
stepped up when somebody dropped. She was supposed to fight somebody else. So she has now stepped up on short notice, supposed to fight somebody else. That person drops. So then Marnik Mann stepped up to fight her. So both of these women in short notice fights. Josephine Nutson, she is a kickboxer. She was a kickboxer before an MMA fighter. She likes to use forward pressure. She likes to use combinations to overwhelm people. Her volume is impressive. And then on her way out of those combinations, she's gonna blast your legs, restart that cycle. She can grapple. You saw a bunch of takedowns in her contender series win, but that's not really her go-to. She did that because she was fighting a very good striker. So good on her. She adjusted her game plan, started grappling. If you do see her grapple in a fight, it is typically to hold you against the cage, rack up a little bit of control time. She's taking on Marnik Mann, another UFC debut, another woman stepping up on short notice. She's pretty well-rounded. She's tiny, a tiny little thing. She's like five feet tall. She's aggressive. She's going to come out with her striking. She's going to bang. She's going to look to wrestle, look to grapple. She has no issue coming forward. She has has no issue getting into a slugfest and then she'll transition that into wrestling. If she gets the takedowns on top, she's going to pound away. And if you create a scramble, she's going to roll with it, look for a submission. She is very impressive. If you go through a record, you're going to see that contender series loss. She's much, much better than that contender series loss. Here's the reality of it. Josephine Nutson is at an astronomical price point. They're acting as if she's a tried and true established entity. She's stepping up on short notice. She also is very inexperienced. So is Marnik Mann. This should be closer to 8,000, 8,200. Why the odds are what they are, why Josephine is such a wild, incredible favorite is beyond me. I guess we'll all find out together and maybe I'll look stupid if Josephine blows through Marnik. With that being said, 0% chance I spend that money on Josephine. I mean, $9,500 on a short notice UFC debut that has no real experience against another short notice UFC debut that has no, there's too many unknowns here. No shot I spend the 9,500 and that 6,700 is actually looking pretty good depending on what the rest of my lineup does. Then we have Charlie Campbell, another short notice UFC debut. He has one single fight in the Contender Series. Contender Series fights don't show up here even though they're UFC. Uh, and that fight was a knockout loss. The reality is he's much better than that fight as well. He's a striker. He's got technical skills. He's going to look to pick his shots. He's going to look for accuracy instead of just blasting away and running forward. He can be hittable because he keeps his hands a little bit low, but he has really nice leg kicks, really good takedown defense. And if he ends up on top, he'll be very, very busy. He's coming out of that Sarah Longo fight camp with Al Jermaine, and uh, Chris Weidman, and that whole crew. So you know he's been in camps. All of them have fought somewhat recently. He's been in camps for a while. He's been training. He's been active. But he is stepping up on short notice to replace Natan Levy. He is fighting Alex Reyes. You're going to see one fight here from 2017. He didn't come into the UFC, lose to Mike Perry, then leave, fight elsewhere. He lost to Mike Perry and then had a litany of issues over the last six years. He hasn't fought in six years. He's had some very, very serious medical issues. He should be done with all of them. Obviously, he's been cleared to fight and he's going to fight. The reality is before that, all we can do is assume he's going to be the same, maybe a little better, maybe a little worse. We don't know. You know I, I don't imagine all of a sudden he's a completely different fighter, but maybe we don't know. But before that, when he was here six years ago, he was, you know, uh, going to come forward. He's going to pressure hard. He's going to brawl on his feet. And then he's going to look to grapple. Come forward, ba ba ba, shoot, ba ba ba, shoot. And that was basically his style. He did get chinned by Mike Perry. No shame in that. He does that to a lot of people. I'm going to mention this. It means nothing, but he is Dominic Reyes, the light heavyweight. I think he's his older brother. Might be younger, but I doubt it because he's 36. So he's the older brother. They don't fight similarly at all. It means literally nothing here. But I think Alex Reyes gets absolutely smoked. I think Charlie Campbell, short notice, won't matter here because his opponent hasn't fought in six years. They're both going to be working through the oohs and the ahs of being in the octagon. So I like Charlie Campbell. I think his price point is affordable because, frankly, Yes, it's $9,300, but I do think he's going to win this fight and probably by stoppage. Then we have a grappler delight. We have Tracy Cortez taking on Jasmine, Jazzy Deficious. Tracy Cortez wants to come forward, wants to wrestle, wants to grapple. That is it. There's no other. Her striking kind of sucks. You're going to see if you go digging into her stats, she does have a positive striking differential. But once you factor in the fact that she's getting all these takedowns, has all this control time, the fact that she is not dominating 
striking numbers wise, it means that she's getting the crap beat out of her on her feet, then gets some takedowns, and then she, you know she's landing unanswered shots. Once it gets to the ground, she's got great control, very good submissions. Her takedowns are good. They're not amazing, but they are good takedowns. And you know she's a high level grappler that only has one single loss in MMA, and it has been a very very long time since then. She's on a nine fight win streak. Most recently, a 29-28 win over Melissa Gatto. I specify the scorecards to show she is human. She does lose these fights, or you know can lose a round at least. She's taking on Jasmine Jazzadivicious. We love Jasmine. We were all over Jasmine to beat Miranda Maverick, and then she beat the shit out of Miranda Maverick. And the craziest part about that is she didn't use her wrestling. She had one single takedown in that fight, and it was on one attempt. It's not as if she shot 40 times and got one of them. One single takedown attempt, and it worked. She got that takedown and basically was there for good measure because she was controlling the striking, defending the takedowns, controlling the pace, controlling the fight as a whole. Jasmine Jasmine Vicious is a wrestler. She wrestled long before she converted to MMA and she has those wrestling skills. In MMA, her hands are getting better. Her wrestling is getting better. She did lose to Natalia Silva. Natalia Silva also took her down twice. So you might be saying, well, if Natalia Silva can take her down, so can Tracy Cortez. Tracy Cortez is a better wrestler than Natalia. That's a true statement. But I don't think Tracy Cortez is going to take down Jasmine because Natalia Silva was able to take down Jasmine because Natalia Silva set it up with her striking. Wildly athletic, fast, incredible striking. She set it up. She had Jasmine sort of out of sorts and then she capitalized with the takedowns. Tracy, her striking sucks. She's not going to set up these beautiful takedowns with striking. All of that being said, I am on the Jasmine side. Am I going to plant my flag and say 100% like I did with Miranda Maverick? She's going to beat the piss out of her. She's going to win, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm not that confident. But I do think Jasmine's going to win. I will have her in my lineup. But whoever you have, whatever side you're on, you should have in your lineup. Yes, she beat Miranda Maverick, put up 85 points. I'll take that on an $8,000 fighter. But she only got one takedown. I think this fight's going to have a lot more wrestling than that one because I think Tracy's going to shoot some takedowns. Jasmine may stuff them, spin, get her own control, or it could look exactly like this win. And if it looks exactly like this win, fine. I would have preferred the 6,900 price point like we got her against Miranda, but I'll still take that win. So Jasmine, all likelihood in my lineup. But if you're on the other side, Jacob is squarely on the other side of this fight, then Tracy Cortez should be in your lineup because she's just $200 more and she definitely, there's a 0% chance she wins with striking. So if she wins, it's absolutely with the grappling. And as we all know, grappling scores very well. Then we have Edgar Chavez taking on Daniel Lacerda. Edgar Chavez, this guy's a solid fighter. He did step up on short notice. He did lose to Tatsura Tyra. I was there live. If it, it, There was a moment where he looked like he was going to win. He dropped Tatsuro. He kept pulling guillotine. One of the guillotines at the end looked like it was actually going to work. He had a reversal. He scored decently considering he was basically pulling guard on his back the whole time. But the reality is his striking offense is fast. It's in your face. His takedowns are decent. His BJJ is actually pretty good. The only real issue for him is that he's incredibly hittable. And against Tatsuro Tyra, he was pulling guard. I mean, he was jumping guillotine. Pulling, and it's, a, it's always a bad look. A bad, bad look when somebody does that. I don't know if it was low fight IQ or it was just short notice or what. He almost got the last one, but he didn't. Reality is Edgar Chavez is better than that performance and also not as good as that performance. Meaning, he is better than a guy that just jumps guillotine over and over and over. But he is also not the guy that can almost beat Tatsuro Tyra, if that makes sense. He's not that good. He is hittable. He does get blasted, and he does make poor fight IQ decisions. $8,700 seems expensive, but when we look at who he's fighting, he's fighting Daniel Lacerda. Forget all the, I mean, look, D.DA. So look, I mean, it's a mess. He's got a few different last names depending on when you research him, when he fought. None of it makes any sense, but we're going to go with Daniel Lacerda. He is 0-4 in the UFC, and it is by stoppage, all four of them. But let's just look at what he just did to C.J. Vergara. Knocked him down twice. Honestly, if you had a counter and you didn't see the official stats, it looked like he knocked him down 15 times. He had a takedown. He almost had him out of there. That first round should have been a 10-6. It was wild what Daniel Lacerda did to C.J. Vergara in that first round. Same thing with Victor Altamirano. Dropped him. Almost got it done. The point here is that Daniel Lacerda is wildly dangerous. He has one round of I can kill you. And then he can get chinned, then he can get tired and submitted. 
there's a lot going on here, but Daniel Lacerda is wildly dangerous. Also, folds. So, Edgar Chavez at that price point, here's the problem. Edgar Char is $8,700. If he wins this fight, he'll definitely be worth the points because everybody who beats Daniel Lacerda scores that many points because he gets finished. But Daniel Lacerda is insanely dangerous and he absolutely could come in here and knock off Edgar Char's head. So Daniel Lacerda is definitely a punt play for some of the large GPP tournaments because there is a world where he wins and he scores really well. That world does exist. Reality is Edgar Char is, is tough should be able to weather the storm and then get his own finish. So, uh, you know, Edgar Chavez at $8,700, as much as I hate it, probably ends up being worth it just because history tells us anybody who beats Daniel Lacerda scores some very real points. Then we have Roman Kopilov taking on Josh Frem. I'm going to tell you a couple things about Roman. One, I think he should beat the shit out of Josh Frem. Roman Kopilov is a phenomenal kickboxer. He was a professional kickboxer long before MMA. And when he's in there and he's striking with you, it looks like he's a professional kickboxer. He's going to come out. He's going to pick his shots well. And then when he finds his rhythm, he's going to let his hands go and really start to put in some work. He just knocked out Claudio Ribeiro in that second round. That was a great fight. And then before that, he smoked Polihio Soriano. Before that, he smoked Chichar uh, Di Chirico. Uh, uh, Albert Durev beat him with a takedown. Uh, Roberson beat him. He submitted him. The reality is he does have some grappling holes. He's not the easiest guy to take down, but if you do take him down, he doesn't have much to offer. That's the first thing I'm going to say about him, right? Nasty kickboxer should dominate this fight. $9,100 feels like a discount. Second thing I'm going to say, and this is stupid. I probably shouldn't even say it. It doesn't matter. For some reason, I just feel, and I, I hope I'm wrong, right? I'm not always right. I just feel like Roman Kopilov is going to lose this fight. I don't know why that is based off nothing. Josh Freem kind of sucks. Let's talk about Josh Freem. But I just have this like weird, bad feeling. And I think it is probably because Josh Freem has been posting a bunch of Instagram videos of him like lighting legs up and like he looks great. The dude looks great. In training, looks great. But then in actuality, he comes out here, can't even take down Jamie Pickett, gets taken down three times. Yeah, you take down Dumas a few times, but that guy sucks. Treshawn Gore submitted him, but kind of a fluke. Like, that's the problem here. You can go through Josh's record and say, well, he did beat Jamie Pickens. Jamie Pickens got good takedown defense. And yeah, he beat Dumas. Dumas just beat Cody Brundage, but Dumas sucked. Like, there's so many variables here. Let me zoom out. Let me back up. Josh Freem, very athletic guy, needs to wrestle to win this fight and win most fights. He doesn't have a background, right? I said Roman Kopilov is a professional kickboxer before MMA. Josh Freeman has none of that. He was nothing before MMA. He became an MMA fighter. That's good in a lot of cases because he's just learning all the different techniques. He's sort of turned into a grappler. He's going to want to shoot, going to want to get takedowns. Striking's not terrible. It's not great. Takedowns aren't terrible. They're not great. I don't see him winning this fight. I think Roman Kopilov beats the piss out of him and he should be worth the money. I will have Roman in my lineup. But I have some weird gut feeling that like he's going to lose. I'm going to do nothing with that information other than throw it out here and it's stupid. I shouldn't have said it. All it does is confuse people, but I don't know why I've got that bad feeling. Maybe it's PTSD from Israel Adesanya and I am pretty exposed to Roman Kopilov in my bets and I'm just going to double down on that exposure here in DraftKings and hope that my gut is wrong. Then we have Lupita Godinez. Taking on Elise Reed. This is another fight. Loopy should beat the shit out of Elise Reed. Loopy is a big, relatively speaking, these are very small women, is a big, strong wrestler. She's going to come forward. She'll strike and blah, blah, blah. And then she's going to grind you to the ground, beat you up from there. If she does that. If we can trust her to do that. I say if because she's coming off this win over Cynthia Calvillo. That fight sucked. She didn't wrestle at all. No, I mean, it was absolute trash. 66 points in a win. It was trash. You can't count on her. Before that, she lost to Angela Hill. Same thing. Didn't get the wrestling. Angela Hill you can be taken down. She didn't really get the wrestling going. Didn't really focus on that. 44 points. I mean, just trash. Just trash. But the the loopy who beat Ducate, the loopy who just pounded the shit out of Carnalozzi, the loopy who pounded the shit out of Lukboomi, that loopy 
can honestly compete with some of the best in the world. She should be training with Alexa Grasso, should be wrestling, grinding, getting that stuff in, and hopefully she shows up here and she does that. She wrestles, she grinds. If she does, this 9400 will be well worth it. But I'm probably going to avoid her because it has been a long time since she has been worth $9,400. We have to go all the way back to the Carnalozzi fight, and then before that, we have to go to the Gomez Juarez fight. Because outside of that, she doesn't wrestle as much as she should, even though we want her to. She's taking on Elise Reed. Elise Reed is better than what people give her credit for. A lot of people want to pretend like Elise Reed sucks, and she doesn't. She's insanely tough. She has ridiculous power for this weight class. She's going to set a really nice pace. She's going to get in your face. She's got decent grappling, very good cardio. Um, her performances are a little bit hot and cold, but she does have knockdowns because of that power, like Melissa Martinez, that win here. The Loma Lugbumi fight, first of all, two things. One, Lugbumi is great. She is very, very good. And two, Yes, Elise was finished, but she showed us how tough she is. She took an absolute beating. I think this fight goes the distance. I think Loopy wins. I want to see Loopy wrestle. I want to see Loopy put up 130 points, but I, I'm not, I, I just, you just can't trust her to do it. And because I can't trust her, I won't have her in my lineup. I don't think Elise is going to do much. I think this is going to look, you know, like a, a 20, 15, 20, 25 point loss. So I'm not going to have any money uh, in DraftKings on Elise either. Then we have Fernando Padilla taking on Kyle Nelson. Fernando Padilla is very good. This guy's a long, rangy striker, but he wants to fight in the pocket. So he's long. You look at his body, you would think he's on the outside touching you up, but no. He gets in the pocket. He wants it to be dirty. He's an aggressive guy. He's going to plot forward and then work inside there. He'll clinch. He'll fire up knees. If you get it to the ground, you might be like, oh, thank God, I'm out of danger. But he's so long, he will work in those submissions. He'll wrap you up. He'll tie you up. He'll make some very weird stuff happen. He is coming off the UFC debut knockout win over Julian Rosa. A lot of people think it was an early stoppage. It probably was. But he did showcase just how good he is because his striking was insanely accurate. Accurate, and he lit up Julian Erosa in the you know, first couple of minutes of that fight. He is taking on Kyle Nelson. Kyle Nelson, pretty good striker himself. He's got some very real power in his hands. You can see here he's been in the UFC since 2018. 2018, but he's got two wins, four losses, and a draw. So not the greatest success record, but this last win was a very good one over Blake Builder, and basically, he just stayed in his face. He had a lot of pressure. He stayed busy. His takedown defense was pretty solid as well. Overall, he's a powerful striker who sets a nice pace and gets in people's faces. I think Padilla is going to win this fight because I think Kyle Nelson's going to get into his face. And I think that's exactly what Padilla wants. And Padilla is going to win those pocket exchanges, win inside the, you know, inside that, that clinch and get it done. I'm probably not going to have Padilla in my lineup though because, you know, I, I don't want to fall into a weird Kyle Nelson trap because there's always like, oh, he could win this fight. He could win that fight. Uh, you know, he had a decent performance against Choi as well. All of a sudden, Kyle Nelson could be decent. So I'm going to leave it alone, but the reality is it probably looks like this, just like with Fajeda. He's going to get in Padilla's face. Padilla's going to light him up in the pocket, knee him, work him, and then get the finish. Super accurate striker. So I probably won't have Padilla in my lineup at $8,900, but... I also might, right? I'm on the fence. And I'm really on the fence because all of a sudden, Kyle Nelson, those five takedowns against Duho Choi, uh, you know, that, defending all the takedowns, staying in, in Blake Builder's face, and Blake's pretty good. All of a sudden, it's like, man, is Kyle Nelson good? So that's the only thing keeping me hesitant because Padilla is good and Padilla could win by stoppage. So we'll see how I feel when I'm building my final lineup. Then we have Daniel Zellhuber taking on Christos Gallegos. Daniel Zellhuber. Another guy who's an impressive striker, really aggressive, very dynamic. He's got really long limbs, just like Padilla, who we broke down. He uses those, though, to fight at range. He's going to stay on the outside. He's going to fight at range. He's going to touch you up. If he gets to the ground, he's going to use that to lock you up, tie you down, lock you down, work those long limb-style limb submissions. He does a really good job kneeing and striking his way out of takedown exchanges. He's got that solid takedown defense. The only thing that concerns me here, I do think Zan Daniel Zell Huber wins this fight. Probably going to end up being worth the money, but probably not. 
if that makes sense. I'll break that down in a second when I get to Chris Jones. The one thing that really worries me is this loss here against Trey Ogden. Trey Ogden was able to beat Daniel Zellhuber because he stayed in his face and he kept threatening takedowns. So Daniel was not throwing anything. He was too worried about what was coming at him. He didn't push anything. He didn't come out there with his aggressive, you know, his striking. He didn't come out there with any offense. He was so worried about the defense, he never let his hands actually go. This fight could look somewhat similar. He's taking on Christos Gallegos. He's a grappler, but he does have insane power in his hands. He's also proven he's never out of a fight. He has more than one come from behind victory. His striking can definitely use some work like technique-wise, but again, he has that insane power. We saw that against Ricky Glenn with that super early knockout, and you see here, he was a very big underdog. If Christos stays in Daniel Zell Huber's face, then Christos can absolutely get him backing up, get him to question what's going on, and then maybe land that big power from Ricky Glenn. But Ricky, you know, Christos' losses are solid. Tiago Moises, Armin Sarukian, those are quality losses. Jakar Close, like Oliver, like these are good losses. He is old. He is sort of slowing down. Um, you know, he does have that big power in his hands, but outside of that, he's not going to be the better striker. I'm going to avoid this fight entirely because I can see how Chris Jost wins, even though I don't think he does. And then Daniel Zellhuber, if he wins, probably puts up some decent points. But I'm going to leave that alone as well because he may also just be playing patty cake on the outside the entire fight. So I'm going to fade this fight and I'm not going to have either one of those guys in my lineup. Then we have Raul Rosas Jr. taking on Terrence Mitchell. That kid is $9,600, okay? And that just gets tricky because if you look at the Jay Perrin fight, he put up 106 points, somewhat worth it, right? You want a little more out of a $9,600 fighter, but somewhat worth it. He is a kid. I'm going to call him a kid. He's a kid. He's 18 years old. He's barely old enough to, to do a scratcher, let alone have a drink. And he's going to come out there. He's gonna immediately going to start grappling, immediately take a wrestling shot, immediately start controlling, chasing submissions. That has worked for him. All the way up until this Christian Rodriguez loss. That, do you hear my dog snoring? I don't know if the microphone's picking that up. This old fat bastard. Anyway, Christian Rodriguez was able to beat Raul Rosas Jr. by weathering the early storm and then just not gassing himself out. Raul Rosas is so young, so excited to win a fight. He got the takedowns early. He dominated early, chasing submissions, squeezing things, overly working, chasing stuff that isn't there. Then he just really gassed, adrenaline dump, didn't get the finish. And then all of a sudden, Christian Rodriguez just defending shitty takedown attempts, staying alive. Stay, and all of a sudden, Christian Rodriguez ran away with that fight. And that could be the problem here, but I don't see that happening. $9,600 is a lot of money to spend. And you're going to need a whole bunch of takedowns, a whole bunch of control time, and then a finish for it to be worth it. But he's taking on Terrence Mitchell. Terrence Mitchell is also a grappler. He's a lean guy. He doesn't have the best takedowns, but he is very, very dangerous on the ground. He's sort of a cocky asshole. The most popular video is cocky fighter gets knocked out because he was mean to Kai Kara France, ran his mouth, and Kai Kara France just absolutely lit that dude up. He actually is pretty good on his feet, though, so that fight isn't the full vision of what this guy is on his feet. He's fast. He does a great job throwing up kicks without notice. He's just going to be in your face. Boink. Kick. And he can knock you out. He can also submit you, but... We've seen in the past he can get taken down and held down. I'm probably going to fade this fight entirely. I don't think Terrence Mitchell is going to win this fight. I do think Raul wins, but he may not be worth the $9,600, especially not when we have some other fighters at the $89, $9,200 range that could put up well over 100 points. Raul Rosas may not get there. So I'm probably going to fade that fight, even though I'm very confident in Rosas to win. Then we have Jack Della Maddalena taking on Kevin Holland in the co-main event. Phenomenal co-main event. Phenomenal co-main event. Both of these guys are fighting the best fighter they fought at this weight class, essentially. Jack Del Maddalena, phenomenal striker. He pumps the jab. He keeps it in your face. He just absolutely lights you up with that. Then he finds his power. Historically, takedown defense was pretty solid. And uh, we've also seen him, you know, like this submission against Brown. Dropped the dude, climbed on his back, submitted him. The problem is Jack Del Maddalena is coming off. I, I'm not even going to re-say that. I butcher that. Coming off this win over uh, Basil Hafez, he looked like shit. He looked like shit. Got taken down three times, which is the most he's been taken down in a fight. He just looked out of sorts. He looked 
you know, it just didn't look good at all. Frankly, he did cut weight twice in a week, essentially. His fight was canceled. There was a lot going on, and that probably is the issue. Plus, Basel is tough, comes forward, wrestles like a beast, throws big power. But Jack Del Maddalena, before that fight, looked like the real deal, right? He's lighting people up on the feet, winning by knockout, winning by stoppage. And that was the first time we've seen him go the distance in the UFC, and maybe that was good to see as well. He's taking on Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland, long, rangy, powerful striker. So while Jack Madalena is going to be in your face and pump a jab and stay there, Kevin Holland's going to be on the outside, laser pinpoint accuracy. Just boink, boink, whoop, whoop, boink. And that's how he's going to fight. He's going to be smiling the whole time, talking the whole time. Maybe it bothers Jack. Maybe it doesn't. Personally, I think Kevin Holland wins. I'll have Kevin Holland in my lineup. But I fully understand why most people are on the Jack Della Maddalena side, especially with that jab. If he could find that jab and just stay in Kevin Holland's face, he's just going to murder the dude's face and then win that fight. So Kevin Holland at $7,900, is he worth the money becomes the question. Probably not. Because if we look at his, let's see. Finally, we got a decision win here. If we look at the decision win, he doesn't really score that well because I don't think he's going to knock out Jack Della Maddalena. So then we're just relying on strikes. There's no takedowns. There shouldn't be. Maybe there is, but I doubt it. There should be no takedowns. I don't think there's going to be a finish. So now we just have significant strike numbers and things like that. Yes, he did 61 points in a loss to Wonderboy, but he beat Wonderboy's ass in that first round, and then he had two takedowns later. So all of a sudden, you know, there's there's some extra points there that wouldn't normally be in the mix for a Kevin Holland fight, but I think Jack's going to come forward, try to find that job, jab, and Kevin's accuracy is going to be right there, and we haven't seen Jack lose striking exchanges yet. Yes, Basel was able to take him down, had some success on the feet, but I think Jack's going to potentially get frustrated by Kevin when Kevin's like, whoop, whoop, slip, blast him in the face because all of a sudden, even though his nose is on the other side of his face, Jack Della hasn't been hit that often in the UFC. And if we just go through who Jack has fought or who Kevin has fought, Michael Chiesa, yeah, he made him look like a bitch and Michael's old and whatever. Ponzinibbio, Thompson, Shimaev, Means, Oliveira, Dawkins, Vittori, Brunson, Souza. Like these are very, very Buckley. Hernandez, Al, like these are very Mearshart. These are very good fighters in two different weight classes. And yeah, he didn't win them all, but he has that experience. Like nothing phases him anymore. So I think Kevin Holland is going to win this fight. I also don't necessarily think he's going to be worth the money. If you think Jack Maddalena murders Kevin Holland here, then throw him in your lineup because that dude historically scores incredibly well because he's usually winning by finish when he does win. Main event of the evening, I'm going to tell you right now, Pick your side. It's a five-round main event. I imagine there's going to be some grappling. I imagine it's going to be a very, very busy fight. Pick your side. They're both affordable. Valentina is the favorite, the slight favorite here. She obviously lost the first fight. Valentina Shevchenko is definitely the, the greatest fighter this weight class has ever seen and the second greatest female fighter of all time behind Amanda Nunes, who only looked human once and then avenged that loss. Valentina Shevchenko lost to Amanda Nunes. Outside of that, dominated, beat jo uh, Joanna Jerjacek, Karmuch, Maya, Andrade, Murphy, Santos. People are shitting on these people. Oh, Lauren Murphy sucks. We know Andrade sucks. Jennifer Maya. People are shitting on that run, but all Valentina did was beat the absolute piss out of every single person they put in front of her until she got to Tyler Santos. That was a really close fight. A lot of people think she lost that fight. Then she fought Grasso, was winning the fight. She was winning the fight three rounds, 2-1 or two rounds to one. The fourth round was not scored. Two rounds to one. Official won the, was winning the fight. Then all of a sudden, getting takedowns because she's losing the striking exchanges. Good stood up. Tried some stupid spinning bullshit. Alexa Grosso jumped on her back, submitted her. You want to call it a fluke? Fine. I don't think it's necessarily a fluke because it was the fourth round and Valentina was sort of struggling with the striking but was having success with the wrestling. Personally, I think Valentina comes out, looks like a Namaga Madoff, gets all the wrestling going, and wins this fight. I'll have her in my lineup. But with that being said, Alexa Grasso is very, 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 very good. She just beat the divisional GOAT, and she beat her ass striking. We can't forget that. Alexa Grasso won the first round. It was on the scorecard. She won the first round, and she beat Valentina Shevchenko at her own best thing. Valentina's best thing is striking. Alexa Grasso won all the striking exchanges, which is why Valentina started to wrestle. But Valentina then had success wrestling, and I think she's smart enough to go to her camp, wrestle like an mf -er, and then come back and then 
out wrestle Alexa. But Alexa did defend the late takedowns because Valentina was tired. Alexa didn't win the striking exchanges. And if you think Alexa wins $7,700, she absolutely should be in your lineup because since this weight class change, she's looked unstoppable. Smoked everybody she could smoke. She smoked them and then won the belt. And now she's defending the belt. This is in Vegas, but it is going to feel like a hometown crowd for her because it's basically a UFC Mexico card. It's on Mexican Independence Day. They made a belt especially for Alexa, a uh, Mexican championship belt. So I'm on the other side, but if you're on this side, have at it. The most important thing is that you go to wewantpicks.com, you click become a member, and you become a premium member. It's only $10 a month. You're going to get things like courses. You're going to get things like the DraftKings lineup optimizer that will literally build lineups for you. You're going to get things like all of our DraftKings plays, the ownership projections, the scoring projections, and you could be one of these premium members that have won over $370,000 in the last three months. Last week, we had a $46,000 winning ticket. The week before that, we had a $51,000 winning ticket, and they did that with our tools with our insight. It is not a coincidence. It is not an accident. These people are dominating and winning massive amounts of money because of our tools, because of the community, because of everything. We want picks.com. Click become a member. It is only $10 a month.